All right, good morning. Let's get started. Uh, I've been handing out the buoyant force lab. That's what we're doing today and tomorrow, depending on when your lab is. Uh, if you get a chance, please just read over this before you come to the lab. We'll talk about it more there. All right, so we've got some important things going on this week. You've got a homework assignment due on Thursday, and we're also going to have our first exam of the semester on Thursday. So I think I've talked about the exam before, that uh, we're going to have a 75-minute time limit for that. The equation sheet is already available on MU Online if you want to get an early look at that. You don't need to print it, though. I'll bring printed copies of the equation sheet uh, into the class. Uh, so the coverage of the exam is going to be everything from our first meeting up to and including today's lecture. All right. So any questions about the announcements? All right. Um, so what we're going to do is continue our discussion of buoyancy and then move on to kind of a specialized case of buoyancy, which is stability of floating bodies. Um, before we do that, though, I just wanted to um, reemphasize the idea of how to interpret the geometry of objects from their different views. And so let's say, for instance, that we had some submerged plate. And this is the front view, and this is the side view. Um, so my question to you, just in the margins really quickly, why don't you calculate the actual physical dimensions of the triangle? Like what, what are its dimensions that you'd use, for instance, if you're going to calculate its area? Okay, the reason why I showed you this example is just to drive home the point that, uh, for example, the inclined height of the submerged plate isn't the same as its actual physical length. So if you have a front view and it says it's 110 centimeters from the top edge to the bottom corner, that is the vertical distance from the edge to the corner. But its physical height, as you can tell from the side view, is going to be something different because this length, the uh, hypotenuse of the triangle is going to be longer than the front view might suggest. So um, the, uh, the width of it you can tell from the front view. It's uh, 95 centimeters wide, but then to find the actual physical length of the triangle, then you would square 100 centimeters, add it to square of 200 centimeters, and take the square root. So its actual physical length would be 228 centimeters. All right. So just a, a refresher of the importance of geometry, because I, uh, you know, I prefer that you focus on the the fluid mechanics and not get hung up on trigonometry and so on uh, during the homework or on the exam. All right. So just with that little reminder out of the way, let's continue our discussion of buoyancy. Um, who can briefly summarize? how you calculate the magnitude of the buoyant force. If you've got something submerged, how do you find the magnitude of the buoyant force? Uh, the volume displaced by the object that's submerged multiplied by the unit weight of the ground fluid. Perfect, yeah. So in case you couldn't hear me, said it's the, the volume that's submerged multiplied by the unit weight of the fluid that it's displacing. So here in this uh, example, just to renew those concepts, we've got a barrel that has a two meter diameter and it's 180 centimeters long submerged five meters below the surface we want to know the buoyant force and then let's see if we can calculate whether it will sink or float if we know the mass of that barrel and remember the uh, the criteria that we've used before is comparing the unit weight of some object to the unit weight of the surrounding fluid or another way of doing it is you can compare the buoyant force to the weight so either one of those approaches would work to tell you whether it will sink or float.
Okay, so who got 55,000 newtons for the buoyant force? All right, good. We get that from the uh, unit weight of the fluid and the volume of the barrel. Now, since it's fully submerged, we use the entire volume. But then we need to compare that. Oh, that's a little too far. We need to compare it to the, uh, to the weight to know whether it's going to sink or float. Now, we're given the mass, not the weight. So we need to convert the 1,600 kilograms into some weight by multiplying it by g. And since the buoyant force is greater than the weight, that means it's going to float. The other way to look at it is just to find the unit weight of the barrel. And so the weight divided by the volume of the barrel tells us that the unit weight of that barrel is uh, 2776 newtons per cubic meter compared to 9810 for water. So um, that means the barrel is going to float. So it's not in equilibrium as pictured. It's going to rise to the surface. Another question I could ask is, uh, how deeply is it going to float? Any sense on how you'd calculate that to find out you know, how much is it going to rise out of the water? Well, I mean, what, what's the basic concept? How much volume needs to be submerged? Well, 5.65 is its entire volume, but I'm saying for, for it to float in equilibrium with its weight, how much volume needs to be submerged? Well, remember that what we're looking for is equilibrium is the buoyant force will equal the weight. So as it's pictured right now, it's going to rise to the surface, and then it will stop rising when the amount that's below the surface is equal to the weight of the water equal to its overall weight. So its overall weight that we calculated of the barrel is 15,696 newtons. And so um, 15,696 newtons, and it's 9810 newtons per meter cubed. Can someone divide 15,696 by 9810? 1.6 cubic meters. So 1.6 cubic meters would need to be the volume that's submerged in order for it to be in, in equilibrium. So then what we'd do is we'd have to go through and do the calculations like if it's on its side, if it's floating on its side, that'd be kind of a tricky calculation to find out how deeply submerged it's going to be to get 1.6 cubic meters. It'd be a little bit easier if it's floating on its end like this. But, I mean, that's the main idea, is it would come into equilibrium and it would stop rising when the buoyant force is equal to the weight. Does everybody understand that? Buoyant force equal to the weight is equilibrium. And that's the idea behind this homework problem. Who's already taken a look at this homework problem? All right, it's a little bit tricky, and so I wanted to give you some key ideas on it, in part because Sometimes people aren't thinking about it from the top view. It gives you this side view of uh, this device where there's four pontoons. Let me draw a top view just to give you an idea. We've got these four barrels, and there's, it's supporting some superstructure up above. All right, we've got this device, a platform that's above it. And the barrels are L long. That's their overall physical length. And there's four of them. Um, but we have to have one meter from the water surface up to the top of the barrel that's not submerged. So this is a force balance problem. You're trying to do equilibrium here. And they give you some information about the weight of it. They're saying that the overall weight is 30 kilonewtons for the platform. And then also one kilonewton per meter of barrel length. So if L was two, for example, then that would mean there is two meters and four barrels. So there would be a total of eight meters of length. So you'd have the 30 plus another eight kilonewtons for the total weight. Now the buoyant force, though, doesn't depend on L. What does the buoyant force depend on? The submerged volume, which in terms of L is going to be 
L minus 1. So a little bit of a, a, a wrinkle there is the, the overall weight depends on L, but the buoyant force depends on L minus 1 because it's just the submerged volume that's going to give the buoyant force. Okay? So those are the, the key ideas I wanted to remind you of. Four barrels, if you look at it from the top view, and then it's not the full L that's submerged. It's L minus 1 that's submerged. All right. So let's move on from just pure buoyancy to talking about something that's related to buoyancy but also has some other considerations. Uh, so what are we looking at in this picture? Some guys are having a nice day sailing. Uh, why are they sitting on the edge? Maybe to help it from tipping over. Maybe it's just a great view. Who knows? Who can read minds? Not me. But uh, what we're going to be talking about today is why boats like this are stable. If you think about how tall the mast is, I mean, just from the look of it, it seems like boats are pretty unstable, right? Like that they would be tipping over when you've got so much of the boat is above the water line like this. It seems like uh, these guys are at risk of getting totally wet. So just to understand what's going on, let's compare and contrast two submerged cylindrical objects. So the cylinder on the left is a ballistic missile submarine. And the uh, one on the right, I don't know, is like a toy log at some sort of a family camp, I guess. Now, both of them are floating. Both are cylindrical. Both have people standing on top. So why is it that the sailors aren't struggling to maintain their balance and this kid is really focused, he's in the zone to keep from falling off? Yeah? The uh, center of mass is lower than the center of rotation. The okay. So center of mass. Now the center of mass for this log, we, we can assume that it's just wood throughout. And so the center of mass is in the middle of it. But if you think about a submarine, it's most likely going to have ballast to weight it down at the bottom to make it more stable. And so if we look at a uh, cross-sectional view of, let's say this could be something similar to the submarine, um, it's got extra weight at the bottom. And so what's G here is the center of mass or the center of gravity. And it's lower than the centroid of a circle. C here, the center of buoyancy, is at the centroid of the circle because the water doesn't know if there's any ballast on the interior of that shape. It just knows how much water was displaced. And uh, so the center of buoyancy is a function of the, uh, of the shape of the object's exterior, whereas the center of gravity is affected by the internal structure, not necessarily just the volume that was displaced. Now, these are the definitions, center of buoyancy, center of gravity. Now, this is stable because think about if you rotate it, what would happen? And this is, the G wants to be as low as possible, the center of gravity. Gravity is going to be pulling that center down as far as possible. So if you roll it over, it's going to right itself in this case. Now, if the center of buoyancy and the center of gravity are in the same location because there's no added weight, then if you turn it, it's not going to be, it's not going to move at all. It would be kind of neutrally stable in case B. But case C is that same object from the left, just showing what would happen if you did rotate it. And what we're looking at here, these arrows are the directions of the force. So the buoyant force is in the upward direction. The gravity is down. So the weight of this object is causing that gravitational vector to be down. And so those two different arrows produce what's called a writing couple. A writing couple. And so you can just sort of think about if you had a piece of paper with this sketched on it, and you put your fingers, one on C and one on G, and then you pushed your fingers in the directions indicated, then the paper would rotate. And so this object has the center of gravity, which is off to the side, acting downward. And so it's going to continue to rotate until it comes back into its stable position, which is indicated with the A. So this makes sense to everybody, right? It's pretty obvious why it's stable. 
it's a little bit less immediately obvious why a boat is stable. Because in a boat, you don't necessarily have the center of gravity below the center of buoyancy. Here we do. This is a very simple and clear-cut case that it's going to be stable because the center of gravity is below the center of buoyancy. In the case of a ship, you can still have stability even if the center of gravity is above the center of buoyancy. So here we've got G, which is the center of gravity, and it's a little bit higher than the center of buoyancy because there's a lot of the ship that's above the water line. Who's been on a cruise before? Some of us, right? Cruises are great because you get to eat a lot of stuff. Uh, you just get to lay out in the sun. They're fantastic. The, uh, the most expensive cabins on a cruise ship are the ones that are up high. And the cheap seats are down below, closer to the waterline. But the really cheap seats, you know, like the, the employees, I think, are below the waterline. Uh, I've never been on a cruise where my cabin was below the waterline. Maybe, uh, maybe someday. Um, so the, uh, the buoyant forces are acting up through the center of buoyancy. Gravitational forces are acting down. Now think about what happens if the ship tips. The shape of this hole is not coincidental. It's been uh, honed over many years of naval architecture, partly to reduce the uh, friction as the ship moves through the ocean but also because look at what happens when the ship tipped over. The uh, volume underneath the waterline has uh, changed a little bit, so now the center of buoyancy has changed. When it was straight up and down, the center of buoyancy was in the middle. But now look, when it's tipped over just a little bit, there is added volume on the right side of the ship. I guess, I, should I call that starboard? <laughs> if we're going to be nautical today, the starboard side of the ship. So uh, the center of buoyancy is shifted over to the right because uh, more volume is underneath the waterline on the right. And what that does is it's produced another one of those writing couples. And a writing couple means it's essentially a moment that's going to tip the boat back until it's straight up and then it has no tendency to continue to move. Now the waves are going to be pushing it. Maybe the passengers are sloshing back and forth. But assuming that all other things being equal, once it reaches the vertical position again, then it would have no tendency to continue to tip as long as the key thing here is keeping track of the metacenter, M. The metacenter is the location that the center of buoyancy is pointing towards. So if we tipped the ship over even more, that would shift the center of buoyancy further to the right. But the direction of the center of buoyancy is always going to point at the metacenter. So in other words, the lines going upward from C are always pointing at M. So in this case, the ship was stable, even though the center of gravity is above the center of buoyancy. Uh, and what keeps it stable is the riding couple. So what do you think would make this ship unstable? What could we do to make it so that this ship is increasingly unstable and more prone to tipping over? A non-symmetrical bottom? All right, so like if it didn't have that special feature of more area under the waterline as it tipped, that could do it. What other things about this boat, if we changed its shape or its dimensions or ratios of those things? More weight on top. More weight on top, yeah. So if we move more weight on top, then what does that do? Top. It's going to make it top heavy. And we can kind of like just physically understand why that would make it more prone to tipping over. But if we move weight higher up, then that's going to bring G, the center of, center of gravity, higher and higher. And the criteria that we're going to look for is at what point does it exceed the, uh, the metacenter's location. So as long as the metacenter is above the center of gravity, then it's stable. But if we kept loading maybe box containers and heavier and heavier things up high, like marble kitchen sinks and so on in the fancy uh, 
cabins. If we make the center of gravity higher than the metacenter, then the ship is no longer stable because it won't have that right in couple. If the center of gravity is above the metacenter, then the writing couple won't exist. So if G was above M, then it will tip over. One of the other parameters that would make the ship less stable is if it was narrower. So one of the things providing stability here is a wide ship is more stable than a narrow ship. And that's why uh, you, maybe you've seen a cartoon of like Moana, you know that cartoon? I never watched the cartoon, but I saw it out of the corner of my eye on an airplane. So I know that uh, there's a part of that where it's got like an outrigger canoe. And so like a canoe is relatively unstable because it's so narrow. But one of the ways you can make it more stable for like going out on the ocean where there's lots of waves is you put like a secondary flotation some distance off to the side. So you're essentially making the canoe more wide. Uh, so in this case, this is showing a barge. And one of the things we have to do in these calculations is calculate the area moment of inertia about the waterline. And so the waterline is the shape that's traced by the water intersecting with the hull. And so for this barge, which is longer than it is wide, then what we're going to have to do is consider B, the width, as the parameter that's cubed. And the longer parameter, A, its length, is the parameter that we just take to the first power. And since this is rectangular, it's AB cubed divided by 12. One of the common mistakes that students make occasionally is instead of using the area moment of inertia about the water line, sometimes they'll like try and calculate the area moment of inertia of the shape that you can cross section. And it's not the cross sectional shape that matters. It's the top view shape. So it's, it's the, uh, the contact with the water line that affects that. So if we make B more and more skinny, then that's another thing that could make it prone to tipping over. But the wider it is, uh, the wider the barge is, the more inherently stable it will be. Okay, here's a formula for calculating the metacentric height. The metacentric height is simply the distance between M and G. And what we said is once G gets above M, that's when it's going to tip over. So if metacentric height is positive, then the ship is stable, and as it tips, it will right itself. If the metacentric height is negative, then it's unstable, and it's going to tip over uh, at the slightest, the slightest disturbance. Now, just because you have a positive metacentric height, that doesn't mean that it's, it can never uh, sink. It's, it doesn't mean it's an unsinkable ship. I mean, if you've ever watched any of those documentaries on like Discovery Channel, like fishing in Alaska and so on, I mean, those, those ships do tip over if a big enough wave hit it, uh, then it can't right itself. But a positive metacentric height tends towards stability, and the more positive it is, the bigger GM, then the more stable it will be. And so the things that promote a large metacentric height would be a big area moment of inertia, so maximize I, and you're going to maximize stability. Another way to minimize, uh, to maximize stability is to minimize this volume, the submerged volume, relative to its area moment of inertia. And that's why this barge is going to be relatively stable, is it's very wide and it has relatively low submerged volume. Now that depends on how much rock we put in there. It, this barge is carrying rock. So the more we load it, the more submergence it's going to be. But stability is to have a wide area relative to the submerged volume. And then CG is simply the distance between the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy. So we have to sometimes do like some uh, dimensioning or calculations to find out where is the center of buoyancy and where is the center of gravity. All right. So a big I to V promotes stability, but a big C G distance promotes instability because we're looking for GM to be positive for stability. I've got an in-class exercise I'm going to hand out, and um, 
So to get a sense for how the stability of floating bodies problems go, we've got a barge. And based on where the load is, you can see that the uh, center of gravity is in a nice convenient spot. It's right at the top edge of that rectangular barge. So I'd like you to pair up or work in groups of three and go through this step by step. The barge is six meters wide, 15.25 meters long, and that's the distance into the page, and then the physical height of it is 2.44 meters. And uh, if you go through these steps, then I think you'll be able to assess whether it's going to float upright or whether it would tip over. So in other words, we're trying to find out if GM is positive or negative. Okay, I've got the uh, solution on the screen here if you want to double check what you've done so far to the correct answer. Uh, it's pretty negligible to find the weight, it's just the mass times gravity, so we've got the weight of the barge and the load, and uh, if it's in equilibrium, then the two have to be equal. So what we're saying basically is the buoyant force is going to be equal to the weight, and we use that in step C to find out the... Uh, the, like how deeply submerged it is. So it's volume multiplied by the unit weight. So it's the, uh, the depth multiplied by the six meter width multiplied by 15.25 meter length. So that tells us that it's going to have to be sitting down in the water at a total distance D of uh, 19.78. And just to remind you the parameter D from this drawing over here D is from the water line to the bottom edge. Okay. Now, why is it that I've drawn C not in the middle of that barge rectangle? Because it, the C is the, the center of buoyancy, and it's only what's under the water line that affects the magnitude of the buoyancy and also its location. And so it doesn't matter that we've got this distance above the waterline. C takes into account the center of buoyancy, which is related to the submerged volume. Okay? All right, so um, we found D. Here in the top view is uh, just meant to guide you into using the correct dimensions for the area moment of inertia, where you're cubing the shorter dimension of six meters, its width. Um, and now we have to find out the distance between C and G. So the distance between C and G is going to be half of the submergence depth to get to C, and then adding the distance from the water line up to where G is. And by the way, isn't it lucky for us, isn't it a fortunate coincidence that the center of mass was right at the top of that edge? This problem would have been a lot harder if it just wasn't that coincidental that G is just right there. But luckily for us, it was. So it made things a little simpler. 
Um, all right, so it's stable because the metacentric height uh, GM is positive. In other words, we calculate the, uh, the ratio of I to V, and it's larger than the distance CG. Not by much, but enough that it's going to be stable. Any questions on this illustration? Yes. So you're saying it's like uh, basically like a log? It's on, if its length is longer than... Oh, okay, good question. Yeah. So if the, physical de if the depth of submergence ex exists, exceeds the physical height, then it sinks. That means you've got too much load relative to how much buoyancy can exist. There's, there's no way to provide enough buoyancy to hold it up, I think, is what you're asking. Yeah, but you still do the tilting calculation? <laughs> no, no. Like, will it tip over as it sinks? No, I, don't, I, don't, I think this wouldn't work for that. Yeah. I think uh, maybe the problem he's having, which Alice is having as well, is one of the homework problems. Uh -huh. You get the value to be like right at 8, and the height is 8. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it's just barely enough buoyancy to keep it from sinking? All right, well then, let's hope, let's hope it's not a windy day with any waves coming over the edge. All right. Uh, other questions about this example? All right, uh, let's look at one more example just because uh, it's a little bit of an odd one. And although this is in your past, I wanted to uh, show you a, uh, a curved gate example just in case you got a curveball on the exam. And I haven't read the exam, so I'm not, I'm not saying, well, there is a curveball on the exam. I'm just saying sometimes things can be just unfamiliar enough to throw you off, even though it's the same process that you've learned already, and it's just a very small difference. So consider this system where on the right hand side we've got it open to the atmosphere and so then that means that the gauge pressure of the water where it's touching the atmosphere is zero. And we already know from the hydrostatic equation that when we go down the pressure is increasing and when we go up the pressure is decreasing. And so now consider what's going on with this gate. It has a, a three foot radius of curvature it's a metal curved gate with a distance uh, two feet into the page. So we're actually in a suction zone. The, the pressures are below zero, so they're negative gauge pressures. Now, they're not going to be negative atmospheric pressure, but it is negative gauge pressure if we go up here. And so the pressure is zero if you extend the water line over, but now the pressure is negative. So just by looking at it, how would you say the water is affecting that gate? Like what direction is the, the water either pulling or pushing that gate? It's pulling it close, so the water is actually sucking the gate inward uh, rather than what normally it would do if, if the gate was below the water line, then the water would be pushing on the gate. But in this case, we know that the water is going to be pulling the gate to the right, and it's going to be pulling the gate down. So this example is asking, find the forces required to hold the curved gate steady. So that's the equal and opposite of the forces of the water on the gate. We're saying, you know, here's this gate that's experiencing hydraulic forces on it. Uh, how hard are we going to have to either push or pull on the gate to hold that steady in equilibrium to balance out the forces of the water acting on the gate? All right, so there's a horizontal force and a vertical force. And for the horizontal force, we just consider the vertical projection. And what does the vertical projection of this curved surface look like? It's a rectangle, good. And it has dimensions of three feet tall and two feet wide. So two feet is the width, and three feet 
is going to be the height of the vertical projection. And so how have we found the magnitude of the, of the horizontal forces in the past when the gate's been below the waterline? What's been the formula for that? The pressure at the centroid multiplied by the area. So how did we find the pressure at the centroid? Delta H times gamma, and then multiply that by area to find the, the horizontal force. All right, so here, delta H is going to be the distance from the water surface to the centroid of the gate. And that's the same thing it was before when the water uh, was submerging the gate. Here, the gate's above the water level. But so delta H is just going to be the distance upward from the water to the centroid of the gate. So the centroid of the gate is in the middle of this three feet, so it's 1.5 feet from the edge of the gate to the centroid, and then there's an additional one foot from the water line up to the beginning edge of the bottom of the gate. Okay, so that's how we'd find the, uh, the horizontal force, and the principle of the vertical force has always been about the weight of the water. If you're finding the magnitude of the vertical forces, in the past what we've said is the weight of the water above the gate. Um, but here it's going to be the weight of the water between the gate and the water line. So just thinking about here's the curved shape. We've got a quarter circle and some volume of water if we think about into the page in that quarter circle. And then there's also a rectangular shape that is from the... Uh, the one foot distance into the page, two feet, and then we're not given this dimension, but it's probably pretty close to three feet. It looks like it's just a small overlap for that gate to sit on the edge of that surface there. So let me give you a moment to try and calculate those forces. Uh, the force that you'll get is the force of the water on the gate, but keep in mind that this is asking find the force required to hold the curved gate steady. And so I'd like you to indicate not only the magnitude, but also the direction of the force that has to be applied to hold the gate steady. Here's the unit weight of the fluid. This isn't water. And we're working with traditional units. And so we always get in the habit so far of using 9810 for gamma. But in this case, the unit weight is 50 LBF. And LBF is pounds force. So it's basically 50 pounds per cubic foot is the uh, unit weight of this fluid. Okay, so for the, ver for the horizontal force, we're going up through the fluid instead of down through the fluid. And that's why here for the distance I said negative 2.5 feet is just to acknowledge the fact that when I calculate the pressure at the centroid, that's going to be a negative gauge pressure, which means, you know, normally we assume that the water is pushing towards the gate, but because we're up above the water line, um, and we've got suction, that means that actually the force is going to be acting away from the gate. So this negative 750, the negative just means opposite in the direction we usually uh, consider. So in this case, the force is to the right, so we would need to push to the left to hold the gate steady, since the water is sucking the gate towards the right. Um, and the distance of 2.5 is just uh, the 1.5 to the centroid and then another one foot from the edge down to the water level. So that's where the 2.5 comes from. Uh, as for the vertical force, we want to think about the weight of the water. So we've got some quarter circle that's 
two feet into the page in depth, and then a rectangle underneath it, and calculate the volume of both of those, add the volumes together, multiply it by the unit weight. So the hydrostatic force is acting downward, which means we would have to push up to hold the gate steady. So our process is the same, even though this was a very unusual uh, configuration for the gate being up above a water line, we can still calculate the forces in the same way. I hear it didn't ask us to find the location of the forces, but we could do that according to the same method that we had before as well. I'll give you a moment to copy that down. All right, so um, uh, all right, here we are. Yes, so uh, upload the assignment Thursday. Now, you're not going to have that graded before the exam. So if there's any one of those problems that you're not sure about, you can check with me on the answer or, you know, check with your classmates. That's, that's fine, of course. Uh, but two days from now, you'll be done with the test. You'll be feeling great. All right. Have a good day.